this mula mantra uh, it heals people and it elevates their levels of consciousness it does miracles for them all kinds of things have been reported by merely chanting this uh, uh, mantra so there are uh, so many miracles actually so god himself is uh, everything there was no question of his being exclusively masculine or feminine but if a person so chooses then he can have a masculine god or a feminine god it's again a matter of choice but if you have to say and who is god god is everything you know so we can't say is masculine or feminine if uh, your god were masculine then um, he could behave in a very masculine way uh, he might not uh, behave like a mother he might not uh, respond to your prayers fast and he might not be that kind also but if it were a feminine god the response would be much faster much kinder the core of your being is fear what is deep inside yourself it's just fear fear of losing this fear of losing that failing here or some other worry there the object of fear could be changing neanderthal man had his own reasons to be frightened of the ancient man who was hunting had his own reasons to be afraid of so also the medieval man and modern man has his fear of a stock market crash or his uh, wife running away from him so you have all kinds of fears but basically fear has continued throughout human history because as long as you exist there would be fear because you are not supposed to exist you are only an illusion and every moment there's a struggle to survive unless mental formations are going on all the time you would just cease to be there if the brain stops creating these mental formations you would be gone and nature is trying to make that happen god is trying to make that happen but you are resisting it because you are afraid to be gone you are scared you think it's terrible to be gone but what you do not realize is when you are gone it is the greatest joy you could ever imagine those who have left you should ask them i have around me so many people who don't exist who are gone they live in joy 24 hours of the day nothing ever affects them because as long as you exist you will suffer because you do not suffer you is equal to suffering if you are there that is suffering to exist is to suffer because you have no business to exist it's a limitation it's a narrowing down it's not the truth when you are gone what is there is causeless love simply love for no reason the the love which you know has a reason this love has no reason it is just there you see a dog you love it you see an ant you love it you see a human being you love him it's just then for no reason and what about this joy your joys have got limits this joy has no limit all this happens because you are not there if you are there the love which you know has a reason which is not love the joy which you know has a limit and the joy which has limits is no joy at all you have to jump into it not knowing how to swim you have to take a plunge you take a plunge it's all over most ancient civilizations are describe the changes that take place in the world as the natural rhythms of the universe these are symbolized as the four cycles the arrival of a new cycle symbolizes the emergence of a new perception each of these ages symbolize a predominant culture and the state of consciousness they reflect the understanding and the relationship between matter and consciousness the first cycle is the age of oneness the divide between consciousness and matter was non-existent the second cycle is a time when the perception of the fundamental oneness of all life is beginning to erode nevertheless the perception is one of interconnectedness consciousness influences matter and matter too could influence consciousness in the third cycle consciousness is seen to be superior to matter and hence capable of influencing matter the gulf has deepened in the last cycle matter is perceived to be devoid of life and is a plaything in the hands of consciousness being symbolized by man This fundamental divide between matter and consciousness is supposed to be reflected in all walks of life our science our art 
our values, our religion, our concept of the profane and the sacred, our relationships with one another, our relationship with nature, and ultimately our relationship with ourselves. Every cycle is naturally supposed to roll into the other. And according to the ancients, this is one among the innumerable cycles that have gone before. A change in perception brings about a change in feeling that brings about a change in consciousness. Consciousness impacts your very experience of life, which subsequently creates a shift in destiny. The shift from one cycle to the other is illustrated by a story. This happened in the previous cycle when one farmer sold his land to his neighbor and one day he found a pot of gold in the land. The neighbor came to the original owner of the land and offered the pot of gold saying, I bought your land but not the pot of gold. Please take the gold. It is yours, not mine. The first farmer refused to accept the gold from him. Both fought over the issue and finally the matter was taken to the notice of the emperor. A week later, the farmers approached the emperor but the new conflict this time. Surprisingly, the farmer who sold the land now said, I only sold the land, not the gold contained in it. Give me back my pot of gold. The neighbor now furiously disagreed with him. Unable to find a solution, the emperor presented the issue to Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna heard the story, he declared it has come. We are living in momentous times. We are witnessing the emergence of a new cycle. The year 1989 marks the first emergence of this new epoch called the Age of Oneness. Change is accelerating all around us in every sphere of human existence, be it education, politics, transportation, science and medicine. Where are we going? What is the direction? We are accelerating into a new world, a world that is grounded not in divisiveness and separation, but the oneness of all things. Oneness between matter and consciousness, between man and man, between man and God, between man and nature. We are witnessing the birth pangs of a new civilization, a new perception, and underneath it all is a new flame of consciousness. You should not live with emotions of depression, anxiety, sadness and irritability that are interfering with your natural capacity to enjoy life. Most emotional imbalances have been found to be the result of unmet nutritional needs, malfunctions in our brain body chemistry and unquestioned perceptions. People with prolonged rundown emotions often prove their doctor's failures. The body by nature has been designed for experiences such as ecstasy, love and bliss. And it also knows fear and the struggle for survival. Owing to several challenges, we are only triggering that chemistry of the brain that deals with emotions such as fear, loneliness and frustration. The result is that your brain gets exhausted However, it is possible to activate those parts of the brain that deal with love, skill and solutions. Diksha is activating certain areas of the brain that would not otherwise get affected even after years of meditation. Diksha is proving to be a very powerful tool in returning the body to a complete state of health and the mind to a state of relaxation and rest. The kind of golden age that we are talking about, I don't see any place for religion. Spirituality, of course, would be there, but religion as we know it today uh, would be completely transformed into something else. That something else would just be a spiritual experience, that's all. They would still feel connected to Jesus Christ and the Prophet, but in a very different way. It will not be a belief in Jesus Christ. They would actually see and talk uh, and walk with Christ, and the same would happen maybe with the Prophet. So that would be their experience. 
It would not be based on beliefs. It would be, uh, it would be based on real experience. I often say that uh, I'm God. Now, uh, it has to be carefully understood. To me, all life is one. There's only one life. That which is flowing through you, through me, through your wife, through the lion, the elephant, the tiger, the ant, through the trees, through the sun and the moon, through the universe. The same one life is expressing itself through all these forms. And that life is what I call God. So I am God, you are God, the ant is God, the elephant is God, the crook is God, the murderer is God, the saint is God, the sage is God. These are the different manifestations of uh, God. But when God manifests as a crook, we don't worship him. But when he manifests as a saint or a sage, we worship him. So to me, there is no creator God, a God who creates. God has become all this. It's God who has become all this. So when I am helping a beggar on the road, I'm only helping bigger God. So I've got to help him out because I see that I and he are one. So I'm helping myself. That's why I tell people, look, don't talk to me of love and compassion. I'm not helping you. I'm helping myself. Mm. You're no different from me. It's a living experience. That is my reality. And that's why I say I am God. And I maintain that all people can get to this state. That this should be man's natural state. But for the moment, the one who can see that, experience it that way, we could call him God. And anybody else who can experience that way, he is God. And if all can experience that way, then everybody is God. That is the ultimate objective. That all people should experience God everywhere and that they are that God. That there's, there's nothing else but God only. How could there be anything else other than God? It's just impossible. All that there is has to be God. So whether you talk of your will or the divine will, your will also is God's will. Divine will also is God's will. It's only God's will that is all. Mm. We are going to scratch, that's God's will. <laughs> we are going to have a negative thought, that's again God's will. There's nothing else but God's will. Mm. When you come to that realization that you know that you alone exist. Of course, you don't feel lonely, but there's a certain aloneness. Because you are everything, you know? there's no second person there. That's why we say Advaya, mm. from which comes the word Advaita, you know. Mm. So, uh, this is a real experience. It is within the realm of possibility. It is not fiction. It is not philosophical speculation. I am talking about something which can be your day-to-day -day living experience. Uh, uh, that is where the Diksha should take you ultimately. Mm. That's when you can boldly say, I am God. Mm. It is not that I created this universe. Mm. I have become all this. Mm. I have become the leper, the crook, the beggar, the saint, the sage, everything. So. I am the killer, the killing, and the killed. It's all one and the same. And that is my experience. And I can't say, aha, I am God, and you're not God. No, it makes no sense. Sir. But this can be everybody's experience, because you're also God. The only thing is you're not seeing it that way, I am seeing it that way. And if I can see it that way, why not you? And there are people now, today, who see it exactly the same way as I and Amma see it. So it is beginning to spread now. That's what I would say is the ultimate human destiny. When you get there, and then when you wish certain things, they do happen. You come to me with a problem, I listen to it. I know I'm experiencing that problem, it's me who's experiencing. And I would like it to change, and it changes. That is all. That's how the miracles happen. There's no question of my relating to God. You are only surrendering to another part of you, because there cannot be another. When you say, I'm surrendering to God, you surrender surrendering to that part of you which we call God because we call that the auspicious, the sacred, and you are surrendering to it. You are not surrender, surrendering to a third person or an alien. You are surrendering to your own higher self. That is all there is to it. And because this lower self is very mischievous, it's causing trouble, when we say surrender, it is not in a very uh, cheap way, you know, that uh, you are a slave. It's not like that. You're just putting it aside because it's creating problems, that's all. This coming from the higher dimension, there is a very nice feeling, especially in the chest region. Now, if it is coming from some lower dimension, there will be an uh, uneasy feeling in the chest region. And if you begin to notice this difference, you will soon be able to distinguish between them. It is left to the individual. If uh, Christians come, they very often uh, bring uh, the picture of Christ and place it at the altar. Uh, if the Muslims come, uh, uh, they bring a painting of a certain uh, uh, names of Allah, that's how they do it. And among the Hindus, they could be worshipping many gods. So the freedom of choice is left to them. And there are atheists who come, 
who merely relate to the universe. So it depending on which God you're relating to, uh, your relationship arises. It is dependent on that. So it, it, it could take any form depending on your personality, your conditioning, your background. So all that is uh, an individual affair. So we don't interfere with that. We only tell people have some kind of relationship. If you do not believe in God, try to relate to the universe. That's how the whole program is conducted. And there are some who relate to Amar Bhagwan. The freedom is theirs. The Mula Mantra came through as a revelation. Uh, it just happened that three, four of our people, they all uh, heard it internally at the same time. And then, uh, of course, we have what is called the Antaryaman. That is, we can always refer back to the Antaryaman and find out what is the meaning. So the indweller or the inner guide, it gave us the uh, explanation. And it said, use this as the Mula Mantra. And uh, basically what it means is that uh, what is there, existence, consciousness mm. or intelligence and bliss. It is not just consciousness, it is intelligent consciousness. Because it has intelligence in it. That is uh, the source of all things. And then uh, this becomes uh, Parabrahma. Parabrahma means uh, it is the next level of uh, manifestation or it becomes uh, the universe. And then uh, this Parabrahma becomes uh, Purushottama. That is, it becomes like one being. That is the next stage of evolution. Then Paramatma. Then it becomes the uh, indweller in everybody so as to control and move uh, the creation. And that uh, finally manifests uh, in living beings whom we call the avatar. That is what the mantra means. Uh, it, it's an evolution in consciousness, how uh, the one becomes the many in stages. Now, I know of a person who, who actually loves Shiva. He's a worshiper of Shiva. And uh, when he does worship, worship Shiva, he becomes poor because Shiva is known to take away wealth. So uh, once he's become sufficiently poor, he switches over to another god, Vishnu, and becomes prosperous. Because Vishnu wears jewels, uh, is full of uh, prosperity, and uh, he worships that god and becomes prosperous. But his heart is with Shiva. So this man keeps uh, swinging between both. So it all depends on the kind of god that you uh, worship. If you want courage, then the Hindus worship Anjaneya, or the fierce form of uh, Kali. So depending on the need, uh, they worship the different god, you know. So these gods actually are some kind of uh, archetypes and uh, that gets activated in them and accordingly things start happening. So it is left in the individual's hands. That's why we say create your own god. That is we say design your god, uh, masculine or feminine or both and friendly or uh, one who is tough or one who would uh, quickly answer your prayers or take a longer time to answer, one who might need strong worship or rituals or prayer or just a friendly chat. We say design this. You know, mostly people can design only according to their personality. Otherwise, it's a false design. So they have to first make some changes in their own personality, then design the God, which will really work. So it much depends on you. It's, it also so happens some people are so masculine, they have the need for the feminine. They also would respond better to Amma. It can be that way also. It awesome. could be a balance. And that would respond the way you want it to respond. It, it does not have a stand on its own, mm. of its own, you know. It depends upon what stand you take. I uh, prefer uh, the relationship uh, to be that of a friend. Uh, that's what uh, I'm uh, very comfortable with. Treat me as a friend, you know. I am a bedder. 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 I 
నేచురల్ గా ఆటోమేటిక్ గా జరిగిపోతాయి అమ్మ భగవాను ఒకటే భగవంతుడిలో రెండు ఒక పక్క తల్లిగాను ఒక పక్క తండ్రిగాను ఉంటారు భగవాను తండ్రిగా వాళ్ళకి అనుగ్రహం ప్రసాదిస్తారు అమ్మ తల్లిగా వాళ్ళకి కోరికలు అన్ని వాళ్ళ వాళ్ళ ఆశలు వాళ్ళ ఆరోగ్య సమస్యలు అన్ని వాళ్ళకి అమ్మ తీరుస్తూ ఉంటుంది భగవాన్ వచ్చి వాళ్ళని ఎలా పైకి తీసుకెళ్లాలి ఎలా ముక్తి మార్గంలోకి తీసుకెళ్లాలి అని భగవాన్ ఆలోచిస్తూ ఉంటారు ఎప్పుడు అదే ఛానల్ ఉంటారు అమ్మ వచ్చి ఈ ఛానల్ లో ఉంటుంది వాళ్ళ కోరికలు తీర్చే ఛానల్ లో ఉంటుంది యూత్ కి నేను ఇవ్వదలుచుకున్నది ఏమిటంటే వాళ్ళు హృదయం వికసించాలి వాళ్ళు వికసించి వాళ్ళు బుర్రతో ఆ బుర్రతో ఆలోచించి చేయకుండా హృదయంలో ఏం వస్తుందో అదే చెయ్యాలి అదే నేను ఇవ్వదలుచుకున్న మెసేజ్ స్త్రీ జన్మ ఎత్తిన తర్వాత తను చదువుకోవాలి బాల్యంగా ఉండేటప్పుడు చదువుకునేటప్పుడే తను తల్లి ఎలా గర్భ బిడ్డని ఎలా ధరించాలి గర్భవతి అవ్వాలి బిడ్డని ఎలా చాకాలి బిడ్డని ఎలా డెలివరీ చేసుకోవాలి గర్భంలోనూ మళ్ళీ బయట వచ్చిన తర్వాత కూడా ఎలా చాకాలి ఇవన్నీ తెలుసుకోవాలి వాళ్ళు ఫస్ట్ అంటే వాళ్ళ హృదయం కూడా వికసించాలి వాళ్ళకి అది అనుభవం ద్వారా వాళ్ళు తెలుసుకోవాలి అప్పుడు ఒక ఉన్నతమైనటువంటి ఒక మానవుణ్ణి వాళ్ళు సమాజానికి ఇవ్వగలుగుతారు అప్పుడు కొత్త సమాజంగా అయ్యేదానికి అవకాశం భగవంతుడు వచ్చి ముక్తి మీద మానవుడిని ఎలా మార్చాలి మానవుడికి ఎలా ముక్తి ఇవ్వాలి అని ఆయన నిమగ్నంగా ఉంటారు నేను వచ్చి మనుషులు లౌకికంగా అయితేనేమి వరల్డ్లీగా అయితేనేమి వాళ్ళ కోరికలు సమస్యలు ఎప్పుడు ఆ నిమగ్నంలో వాళ్ళకి ఎలా తీర్చాలని ఆ నిమగ్నంలో నేను ఉంటాను ఒక వ్యక్తి నాకే సొంతం అవ్వాలి నువ్వు ఎవరితో మాట్లాడకూడదు చేయకూడదు అది ప్రేమ కాదు ఎదుటి వ్యక్తిలో మనలో లేని లక్షణాలు ఎదుటి వ్యక్తిలో చూసి వాళ్ళని లవ్ చేసేది అది ప్రేమ కాదు హృదయం వికసించాలి వికసిస్తే అప్పుడు ఎటువంటి వ్యక్తినైనా సరే ఆ వ్యక్తి ఎలాగున్నా సరే మనము ప్రేమిస్తూనే ఉంటాం అదే నిజమైన ప్రేమ అది కూడా అనుభవం ద్వారానే జరుగుతుంది ఈ మానవ జాతి అంతా ఒక వ్యక్తే మానవులందరూ ఒకే వ్యక్తి కిందకి చెందుతుంది నాలో ఏంటో స్పెషల్ గా వెళ్తుంది పోతుంది నేను చాలా నా ఆలోచనలు నా దుఃఖమేను నా ఆలోచనలని మనం అలా అనుకోకూడదు మానవ జాతి యొక్క దుఃఖమే మన లోపల పోతూ ఉంది ఫీల్ అవుతా అవ్వాలంటే కంప్లీట్ గా నీకు అనుభవం ద్వారానే నీకు ఆ స్థితి ఆ లవ్ అంత వస్తుంది అనుభవం ద్వారానే తెలుస్తుంది నీకు కాబట్టి ఆ వ్యక్తిలో పోయేది వేరు నాది వేరు కానే కాదు అంత మనుషుల యొక్క దుఃఖం అంతా ఒకటే అంత మనంతా ఒకటే అది తెలుసుకోవాలంటే అనుభవం ద్వారానే తెలుసుకోండి వీళ్ళు అప్పుడే కరుణ స్థితి వస్తుంది ఇట్స్ మోర్ అ మ్యాటర్ ఆఫ్ హ్యాబిట్ బికాస్ I have been told that there are certain tribal communities uh, where um, people are so brought up that the mind hardly ever troubles them. It's become a custom, a habit with the people there. But the only problem is they do not have much worldly contact. As a result, uh, it looks like the mind comes into play only when necessary. Uh, otherwise, the mind is just not interfering with their day-to-day affairs. In a sense, we can say that these people are enlightened. Uh, so i think man has got into this uh, habit of using it all the time when it is not really required that seems to be the basic problem and if you can be free of the habit and then you're enlightened yes here again i would say to watch your own mind that also is enlightenment and there are times when a uh, thoughts are flowing at, at a very slow pace Uh, that also is enlightenment but probably a, a deeper state and there are times when there are no thoughts at all which is a still deeper state <coughs> so it goes on and on that way so but you can have all your thoughts you can have all your conflicts you can have your mind and still be enlightened if you could watch it as a third person uh, but of course the higher state is when the thoughts are there but they are not in conflict but the still higher state is when thoughts are totally absent and the still higher state is when all the senses are uh, in a very awakened state so it goes on that way i would describe a human being uh, who is not watching his own mind but who has identified himself with the mind and is fully participating within the mind i would say that uh, he is in a he is in prison he is in a jail and all his activities is merely decorating the jail uh, furnishing it with carpets with air conditioners yes. with uh, or other kind of gadgets making his life very comfortable within the jail now i am not opposed to this and in fact i do help people uh, to decorate the jail 
they come with uh, come to me with desires for wealth, for car, for bungalows, for this, that, everything. For getting a beautiful girl to be married to, and I, and I keep blessing them for all that. And that is merely decorating the prison. But that's also fine. But the fact is, however much you decorate it, it is still the prison. So there comes a day when he looks out of the window and he says, "I want to play out in the meadow. I want to experience the sun. I want to feel the rain." And then he discovers he cannot get out. That's when I would say he becomes a seeker, a spiritual seeker who wants to get out. There's discontent in him. Uh, but uh, if he's happy within the jail, then there's no way for me to make him into a seeker. So then I help him to play within the jail. So what we call the four purushatas or objectives in life, artha, kama, dharma, moksha, the first three belong to uh, activities within the jail. Artha means wealth. Uh, kama is fulfillment of desires. Dharma means helping others, doing a lot of social work. But all this comes uh, within the jail. I'm not condemning it. I'm not saying it's not good or don't do it. I'm just saying it's all activity within the jail. Make yourself comfortable within the jail. It's fine. But if there comes a time when you say, uh, this is too much, I can't take this any longer, then I'll help you to come out of the jail, come out of the mind. The thing is, suppose he's out of the mind and uh, he wants a car, there's no problem with it. Because he might need a car, he might need a bungalow. For example, you take Mahatma Gandhi, he used to ride in Birla's Rolls Royce every day when he was in Delhi. Though he himself owned nothing, he loved to uh, go for a ride in the Rolls Royce. So that's perfectly fine. So, but uh, we would not strictly call that a desire, you know. But the other person, he would feel very sick if he doesn't get those things. But for the one uh, who's outside the mind, if it comes, it's fine. If it does not come, it's fine. There is no harm. See, basically you believe there is a controller there who's uh, controlling your thoughts. Now, my stand is that there is no controller at all. But there is a control, uh, which is controlling your thoughts. But there's no controller. Like your hair grows, now, you do not take any decision to make your hair grow. Your nails grow. Now, you're not playing any role in that. The digestive system keeps functioning. You keep breathing. In none of these activities, you have a role. So how come you have a role when it comes to your thoughts? So there's nobody there playing any role, there's no controller, but yet there's a control. Now, the moment you realize that there's no controller, it is not that you're going to lose control. The control is still there, so it'll take care of all your activities. The only thing is you would be completely clear that there's nobody there inside who's controlling. That is the liberation we are talking about. There is only thought, there's no thinker. But the person, the ordinary person suffers the illusion that there's somebody there called the thinker who is thinking. But in reality, there's nobody there. Similarly, you think there's somebody who is seeing. There's nobody there who is seeing. There's only seeing. You think there's somebody there who is hearing. But there's nobody there. There's only hearing. So there's just the experience, that is all. But you have created this concept, this illusion, that there's somebody there who is very necessary, who is very vital and who is doing all those things. That is the root cause of all your suffering. And you have got to realize directly that no such person exists and that all things are just going on. And that is the state we call the enlightened state. Thoughts would continue, there could be conflicting thoughts and they do continue. At the next level, conflict ceases. But thoughts continue. Uh -huh. At a still higher level, thoughts also cease, and this is a never-ending uh, journey.